Starts. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, we're having a bit of uh, technical problems. Uh, I'm the only one here right now. There's supposed to be two more people, but uh, they got, they lost their connection. And Olga, who is a um, uh, moderator, her microphone is off. Uh, so she asked me to uh, read the welcome sentence to you all. So welcome to our second live session that we have on ocean plastics today. Today we will be talking about <clears throat> some of the approaches that we take to tackle the issue of marine plastics. Uh, so I will shortly introduce myself. I'm calling from Indonesia. I'm uh, working at Indonesian Waste Platform. Uh, that's a national hub reaching stakeholders from all sectors, from government, academia, university, uh, NGO, grassroots organizations, local champions and the industry. Uh, the Packaging Federation, the Indonesian Recycling Association and the producers like the bottled water producers, uh, Unilever and so on. So uh, in Indonesia uh, we have a lot of marine debris as you know. Um, according to the research of Jenna Jambek we are the second uh, contributor to ocean plastics after China and uh, followed by the Philippines. And uh, obviously, uh, it's a huge challenge here because Indonesia has so many islands. It has about 17,000 islands, 266 million inhabitants, and about 56,600 kilometers of coastline. Uh, and obviously all the uh, communities along the coastline are hotspots and then there is a huge contribution from uh, riverine waste. Uh, basically all communities inland uh, need water, so they are mostly um, what is it, located near rivers and they pollute too. Uh, and one of the main reasons is because they don't have waste management infrastructure. So, uh, one challenge is the huge amount of uh, packaging, obviously, and uh, we all see all the, the campaigns about um, redu reduction of bags, banning of bags, bottles, and so on, and uh, straws, and... Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hello, who am I seeing here? Okay, I continue. Uh, so, um, uh, so one big challenge of course here is that we don't have tap water, so everybody needs to drink bottled water as long as there's no alternative. And one challenge is the, um, the geographical situation regarding uh, waste recycling sector mainly based on one island in Indonesia, on Java. And then around Java you have all these other islands which produce waste and which uh, needs to go to Java because those islands are mainly uh, agriculture and fisheries islands and no industry uh, production or uh, what is it, um, uh, industrial recycling. So those are some of the challenges. And then uh, another challenge is the total lack of uh, education, environmental education in the curriculum in schools. So basically all generations up to this one have no environmental education in schools. So we introduced a program. I'll show you the book. I don't know if it's visible. So this is a program which is suitable for Indonesia and for other developing countries with low waste infrastructure because it uh, includes the concept of school waste banks. 
because in remote regions there will never be any trucks running around to collect waste and still everybody uh, produces waste and uh, so uh, establishing school waste banks in these communities because schools are the center of these communities uh, that supports some sort of uh, waste in like network uh, expanding and then our work is also daily communications with the recycling sector uh, because on one hand we have um, uh, stakeholders in in all different islands on in Indonesia who want to do something and on the other hand we have the connection with the recycling sector and what we do is we bring them together because uh, actually in Indonesia there is high tech uh, um, uh, what is it technology available to uh, make uh, our plastics re uh, recycled plastics for example for the filling of your mattresses stuffed toys and I don't know what and clothes fleas and so on blankets uh, but most people in Indonesia actually don't know it exists here and so they don't understand that recyclables have a value and uh, so it's very sad because the whole country wherever you go you find yeah money on the streets because it's full of uh, recyclables and uh, due to the lack of waste infrastructure it's on land and then of course we all know that 80 percent of marine debris uh, originates from land-based sources so it's one big a puzzle to uh, yeah bring it all together and it's a, a process of years and years and uh, I forgot to say I live in East Indonesia on Flores maybe uh, you've heard of the Komodo that's where I live and so that's one of the remotest regions in Indonesia so I I've been here for eight years and so I know what it is to try to get a waste management system going in a remote region so I know all the challenges and so on. I think that's enough for, um, for now from my part and uh, I don't know if Richmond is back. Uh, okay, one moment, I'll just have a look. Yeah, he's back. Okay, so I'll mute my phone first, my microphone. And one moment, I see there are some questions. Okay, I'll quickly do two questions and then I pass to the uh, phone to uh, Richmond in Ghana. So one question is uh, from Martin Adansi. Sorry, I have to look with my glasses, it's very small. <laughs> what do I do with people from my own social circle who are deeply ingrained into the disposable culture but are uninterested or unwilling to change their habits their behavior uh well my answer is always show them the short i think five minute video of midway uh that might change their mind you know the impact of waste on the albatross colony there I show it often here to people who have really no clue about the impact of, uh, of the waste they generate that might open their eyes and then yeah there is so many you can show them uh, 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 campaign material and so on people must understand that we have to reduce that's the first principle of, uh, of the three R and but that video I always find uh, I mean when I show it to people their mouth just drops you know uh, when they see these albatross chicks full of uh, lighters and uh, all sorts of pieces of plastic yeah that's one tip and then the next question is from Anna uh, have heard that in Indonesia the main problem is not missing legal regulations regarding waste management but missing enforcement. This is correct. If so, could you please elaborate on that? Uh, yeah, it's true because since 2008 there is a law here on uh, 
uh, waste management uh, at all levels, so uh, even on household level. And the big problem is the lack of enforcement, that's totally right. And so I hope, um, yeah, you have to understand Indonesia has 34 provinces and it's a decentralized government. So every province has uh, their own, uh, what is it? Um, what is it? I can't come up with the word in English. I, I'm from Holland, by the way. So, uh, for example, in my province where I live, there's 23 districts with 23 governments uh, uh, run by regions. And so every, every district has uh, their own parliament and every department. So 23 times uh, education department, 23 times uh, environmental department and so even if the law is in jakarta if local government on provincial level or district level is not interested and it's not on their agenda then it's just not happening and actually we just uh, have a new governor in this province so he's governing 23 districts uh, regencies and uh, he just announced that the people in his town that's an island next to flores in uh, timor have to pay a fine of 50,000 rupiah if they are caught littering. And uh, that seems nothing because that's three euro, if I don't know who's in Europe, but that seems really nothing like a cup of coffee. But if you put it in perspective of the Indonesian average citizen, uh, it's about uh, a day wages because the monthly minimum salary is 1.6 million, uh, 1, 1 million 600. So, okay, and the question is a little bit further. Do you have river barriers? Yeah, we have some. Uh, I've seen uh, one on Bali, and then some people are improvising, uh, but not enough. I mean, there should be in every river. And I heard they're being introduced all over the country. Well, I haven't seen that. But uh, next week there is our ocean conference and I guess then we will get lots of news. It's on Bali. And then uh, another thing I heard, what would you say? How many are there? Yeah, so I, I mean, there's a couple, but maybe a handful. It's not uh, like structural. And what I saw, the one in Bali, looked really efficient. But it depends again, of course, on uh, closing it. It's a very, uh, uh, what is it, um, good system, what I saw, uh, solid. But it has to be cleaned. So if it's not cleaned on time, then it will still uh, litter. And the books, yeah. I don't know, maybe, yeah, the books I can tell you later, maybe first Richmond has a goal and talk about his uh, program in, uh, in Ghana. Oh, and one more question. Okay, one more question and then it's to Richmond. <laughs> how, from Martin Fisbeck, how can ocean information help you in this awareness raising? Okay. Okay, uh, ocean information, yeah, I have to admit I'm very behind because I will explain later, I'm finishing a report with a deadline on Monday, so I'm two chapters behind. Uh, but what I know is, uh, I, yeah, we are, we made a voluntary commitment at uh, our ocean community at the uh, United Nations website. Um, there are so many stakeholders there, but I still miss the connection. I miss the connection uh, between stakeholders and there is so much info out there. You could spend like day and night uh, scanning the internet. And I know it, most of it because of my experience for eight years, but I think there's a huge... Um, what is it? Need for, for example, a database for research. 
who is doing research on what and and that contributes to uh, awareness raising i think because if you have it all in one place then it's easy to find and then also you avoid doubles because one of my experiences is that so many researchers are actually researching the same so i'm not a researcher so there might be a purpose in that but there are also gaps and i think it's urgent to fill in those gaps okay uh okay i uh, mute my my uh mic and then i hope richmond takes over okay Hello, my name is um, Richmond, Richmond Kennedy Kwaku from Ghana. Um, I'm a Merchant Navy officer by profession. Thank you, Nina. Um, very interesting project and all you're doing, and thank you for holding forth. I'm a Merchant Navy officer by profession and founder, co founder of uh, NGO Plastic Punch. Um, so, we the project started in Ghana, especially um, very concentrated in the new Ningo community. Uh, we chose the new Ningo community because this is a turtle nesting area. This is an area where turtle come to nest. So um, basically, this picture here was taken by Eduardo Vasquez, um, who is a Spanish photographer on one of... Uh, this is the area where we are working in Pram Pram. This picture was taken by Eduardo. You could see it is heavily littered with plastics and it is a turtle nesting area. Um, we know that pollutions of the world will, uh, we know that there will be more plastics than fish in the ocean by 2015 if we do not change our habits. And this is the focus of Plastic Punch. Our, our awareness on the dangers of plastics, at the same time coming up with sustainable waste management solutions to the problem. So, so this is another picture in the area where we work by Eduardo. Um, this is in New Ningo. You could see the sea of plastics. Yes, it is. Uh, uh, it's horrifying this situation for these turtles and for the general health of the area. So this is the plastic punch team formed by a multicultural crew of seven um, uh, from Spain, France, young professionals in Ghana, of course, um, young professionals to uh, passion in protection of the environment. So the last time we were on a turtle monitoring section, what really motivated the project is that we went on a turtle monitoring section and out of the six turtles we saw, five were dead. Um, we could not directly link the, the reason for the death of the turtles, but these are two pictures of the two turtles which were dead. The one on the left, you can see hats is back broken, that's a carapace broken um, with like what looks like a propeller. And the other one, Yes, we couldn't see, but when you look at the the plastics on the on the shore, and some of the the turtles were actually entangled in the plastics, the dead ones. So this is what motivated us to start this project in New Ningo. We also found so we usually find some alive. So for example, this is an olive Radley, which came to nest. Um, so what are we doing to? Um, so we have. Um, regular beach cleanups, more of an app where we have action, where the community comes in touch with the problem, and we try to clean the the beach. We do segregation as source so that the the plastics recycler that have Transformers International Nurse Plus. They change the plastics into bricks for road construction and pavements for road construction. Um, we monetize this waste plastics and the of the community. And as we target the, the children, uh, the next generation, so we need this culture, proper ways disposed into them. So these are some other pictures. Um, they are usually very happy to clean the beach, education uh, and entertainment at the same time. So it's full community involvement. We have from some of our, it's full community involvement. One thing I should have added is that Ghana 
uh -huh. that stretches for approximately 550 kilometers. Um, it is generally a low-lying area, and more than 200 meters are above sea level. So um, there are this this the, the the poor sanitation and management. There's a lot of poor sanitation and management of human waste, especially in the coastal settlement, and this adversely affects the the beaches and the economic values. So these are other pictures from our beach cleanups, and we also have awareness sessions in schools and churches. So this um, we also have recycled art workshops um, to encourage reuse. So um, yes, so we do this also so that the people find that yes, I mean the plastic they don't treat it so much of a waste, but find some form of value or resource to it, even if it's not uh, money directly. They find some reuse or give it another life. We also have re mass media strategies which we use. We go to TV channels. Um, we have partners with a lot of local TV channels here in Ghana, and we go to these TV channels to let them. Um, to, 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 to educate the people on the effect of plastics on marine life. So Ghana, there are a lot of different languages in Ghana. We do this on the English channels, we do this on the Cree speaking channel and other language speaking channels to get the message across to everybody. Because the people don't really know about the dangers and when they know about their dangers, those who even know, we think they don't really understand. We try to let them know and understand and hopefully they change their attitude towards their behavior towards uh, reducing their plastic blueprints. Another strategy we use uh, with the mass media is um, theater and drama production. So we have theater and drama production with the Village Mind production, with Village Minds production. And so this project, for example, is a theater series which we have, we play in schools and on special occasions um, for the people to, in the Ghanaian context or the cultural value to let the people be in the situation for them to understand educating and entertaining them at the same time which we call edutainment so this project for example which is a theater series is going into a video series which will be in forms of sitcom and we are working with the french embassy of on that and the french embassy in ghana to produce some skits Another strategy we have also to reach with the masses on the dangers of plastic pollution will be um, the animation concepts we have. So this character is Nazir, it's a very popular character in um, Ghanaian animation. And we involve Nazir and Nazir is on um, creating skits for us to, to, yes, to get to the minds of the children and other people who patronize this animation. With turtle conservation also already said that we have a lot of, or we find a lot of dead turtles on the beach. Um, we, we are working with, we form partnerships to increase our knowledge in this. And we started working with wild seas. Wild seas are working in the west of Accra and our project is in the east of Accra, that is in New Ningo. So wild seas gave us basic um, training on sea turtle handling, um, the, uh, nest relocation, etc. Um, so we are working well with Rises. We have acquired a license to be able to protect and relocate hatches in the area we are working. So that it's not only of the awareness, but also trying to increase the turtle population in the area. So this turtle here is Billy. Billy was a turtle which was gotten from um, the wild seas in the east. And it had ingested a lot of plastics and it had, got, it had to go under six months of rehabilitation. And looking on the right, those are the plastics which were taken out of Billy after its rehabilitation. After it was safely released into the ocean, tagged and safely released into the ocean. We also have the problems of poachers. So the last time we did monitoring, we went to Keta, which is uh, more east of our operational area, which is in Uningo. We got there and we saw 120 dead turtles. There was a massive massacre. There were the the, the turtles were bent. Apparently, there are commercial activities going on in the midst of the turtle in this area. Um, also, with the turtle, we a community we also were at. The picture on the left is from Ada, uh, is from New Ningo on our turtle monitoring section. And there's also this one on the right with a broken carapace, also, um, which is found in Ada. So, in Ada, we found, according to the wildlife um, division, there they have recorded. 300 deaths or 300 dead turtles so far uh, within the period of only this turtle nesting season, which started in August, I would say. So 
a lot of them have broken back like this. And the question is, does it have a link with the um, port expansion project, which is currently undergoing in Tema? We are doing more studies and collaborations and working with stakeholders on this to try to get to um, to gather more information and persuade the, pursue the issue in the right direction. So our ongoing project right now is we are doing research and feasibility into waste management solutions and alternative packaging. The second part of our mission is to find alternative waste management solutions to the problem. We do not want to do any wrong recycling or recycling which will not be beneficial or will cause more harm at the end of the day. So we are still at this feasibility, looking for partnership and um, consulting the minds to see what best will be the best recycling option or what's, whether we should pursue alternative packaging. So we also uh, started working with the turtle crisis we have here in Ghana. We recently started working on developing an app to improve seed data, turtle data collection because we realized on our monitoring sessions in all the different parts except in our area, which is New Ningo, that um, there is not so much proper um, um, seed petal data collection. So this is what we are creating this app and by next year we'll fully launch it and will be operational on the 550 kilometers coastline at all places and available to all places where sea turtle monitoring goes on, on the coast of Ghana. We are also on the multi-stakeholder platform with the UNDP. It is it's similar to what um, Nina is doing in Indonesia. Um, so this platform, we are part of the stakeholders on this platform, trying to map out a waste strategy to have a platform where we, we could easily assess information of the food chain from waste management to collectors and awareness and education at the same time. So this is where Plastic Punch is also playing its part in form of awareness on this platform. So our next event quickly will be a plug-in event because we are more of awareness and visibility and letting people be aware of the problem. So there's a Accra International Marathon and because we want to keep the streets of Accra clean and this marathon has always used a lot of um, water, we will go around picking the plastics they make and we will give it to our partner Macintosh Creatives who will use it for dustbins after. We also have another beach cleanup with um, recycled art with the UN sponsored project, which is Mars Book, on the UN environment sponsored project, which is Mars Book, on the 15th of November in New Ningo. So these are our partners, the Ghana Wildlife Society, um, the District Assembly. We are working with international organizations as well. Um, Kuala Supermarkets provide snacks for our beach cleanup and also because we want to reuse, reduce the use of single-use plastics and they, we are working with them and they started implementing uh, reusable bags in the supermarkets of Kuala. So, um, Yes, funding. We fund our project or we have funded our project through crowdfunding. Um, through crowdfunding. And also we have done this through an award won by the Whitley Wildlife Conservation and private donations as well. This is how we have been funding our project. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoy. Um, we should reduce, reuse, and possibly refuse plastics. I would say that the, 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 the main thing we should do is to rethink and reduce our plastic blueprints. And this is the way forward. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, so there are some questions here. Um, questions to both Nina and Ritmo for Martin. Do you know where most of the plastic that is on the beach come from in origin? So there's a question here from Martin Visberg. He says, do you know where most of the plastics that is in, on the beach comes from in your region? In my region, um, in my region, um, yes, it's basically from land-based sources. So there's a lagoon close to where, where we clean in New Ningo, and we have a lot of plastics coming from this lagoon. You could actually see or realize that most of the plastics that find its way on this beach that we find are from inland sources which is already proven by research. Um, okay. There's another question from Anna Kumenero. Um, how do you monetize the collected waste? 
is this one of the main incentives the people to join your NGO as volunteers or to have waste management? Um, so this is a good question. So yes, this is also for the people to realize exactly to, to find a waste more as a resource for the community to find a waste more as a resource so that they don't find it as trash. This will better or give them the knowledge of segregating a source and they will find more value when they segregate a source by than when they find when they when we monetize the waste that find itself at the at the at the beach because the dirty plastics do not have more uh, much value than the than the than the new plastics at the same time it is also to um improve the waste management situation we have here in ghana okay um so nina maybe you can answer the first question because we have two more questions maybe you yeah. can answer the first question yeah. on, on yeah uh one moment most of the plus on the bridging yeah so um the uh, five guyers institute just did a monitoring they made two trips one from komodo to bali and one from bali back and they found actually that most uh plastic found on beaches comes from the nearest coastal town which is logical but on the other hand uh i just received a me uh, an email two or three days ago i'll just read it to show how far it spreads with the currents with ocean currents that was a message from Anne Hyde from keep uh, bermuda beautiful uh, she says i'm in bermuda and we get lots of floats um, that travel thousands of miles to get to our shores and then she gives some examples uh lobster and fish pot tags from maine and canada they traveled about eight thousand miles across the north atlantic gyre to reach bermuda then octopus pot traps from western africa they traveled about five thousand miles to bermuda and then they found recently uh, hp hewlett packard ink cartridges from the container spill north of the azores so uh yeah it's uh, the currents take it anywhere and uh actually uh it's nice uh, yeah to go back to your talk uh richmond so uh, we are sort of family because um <laughs> i didn't mention yeah i didn't mention before but so uh we went to um the sixth international marine debris conference in san diego and um so i was representing indonesian waste platform and we had a session there with five other or with total five other country networks and over there uh, we uh, decided or we initiated the international waste platform so it's a collaboration between country hubs and ghana uh, the, the the hub you mentioned with uh, undp ghana is uh, also included in that international waste platform uh, with uh, Heather Troutman, uh, who's based in Ghana. So we are uh, related. <laughs> and then, so what we do uh, between these country hubs is also uh, exchanging information about marine plastics ending up somewhere, because the other day, uh australia um uh heidi taylor from the australian network she found uh, they found a dead turtle and they uh, uh did a necrops how do you call it no yeah they opened the turtle up i don't know the english word and then they found a plastic bag from salt like a salt packaging with very vague uh letters on it but uh, a a clear indonesian image like a person with an uh, like a indonesian hat mm. so uh, then she sent us the photo and uh, asked us can you identify this packaging and then we share it on our platform on our we have a facebook discussion forum and then quickly people respond and uh, they came forward with the message it's a uh, old packaging of a certain Indonesian salt producer uh, dating from the 90s 
and we are now 2018. So this packaging has been floating in the sea for years and ended up in some poor turtle's stomach and it died. Uh, so that's one of the examples of collaboration internationally on uh, marine debris which travels. Yeah. And then um, I think Martin had another question. Huh? Uh, oh no, that was the question about the debris where it's found. Yeah. I live directly on the beach here uh, nine months of the year and I see it coming every day and I know that it comes from La Bajo, the yeah. nearest coastal yeah. town, because uh, when I go by boat to town, I see it coming towards me from town. So, I mean, uh, you know, that's just very clear to see. But it ends up also in many other places. And actually, there is a World Bank report. Anybody who's interested in more info about waste in Indonesia, just type in, for example, uh, World Bank Indonesian waste and then or Indonesian marine debris and then you find all the World Bank reports with lots of data but one of the latest reports says for example that the waste of Bali the marine debris on Bali beaches uh, and in the sea uh, originates from Java and so then stakeholders on Bali dispute that because they say it's uh, riverine waste from Bali uh, so, I mean, that's also, again, still many gaps in data. Yeah, but it's clear the currents take it everywhere. And Indonesia has the Indonesian through flow. So waste from Philippines just passes through and goes out on the other end, you know. So, yeah, that's it. And somebody else had a question about... Uh, one moment about the books about the education i have to scroll up uh, one moment anna about uh no that was about the books i don't know do you see it richmond a question about education Okay, and okay, another question from Janet. Uh, Janet, not try to persuade, oh, one moment. Producers to use other types of packaging. Oh yeah, okay, so actually uh, that's why I didn't have time for a preparation of a presentation. We're making a report now together with the Indonesian recycling sector uh about exactly this the packaging which cannot be recycled so there is packaging which just can't be recycled there's no value and it is a uh, multi-layer and uh, it has uh, uh, ink print on it and so when uh, so it has no value for recycling so uh it can't stay in the loop and so uh one purpose of the report is to uh advice producers just don't release products to the market anymore which cannot be recycled um that's yeah what we can do it's it's it doesn't make sense to release packaging uh, so for example uh washing washing detergent in uh, bottles it also comes in plastic pouches and People have the concept that, or they have, they think that you can, uh, that you make the good choice by buying a bottle, and then after that keep the bottle and buy a refill pouch. It's actually on the instructions of the pouch. You uh, open it, cut it, pour it in the bottle. But that pouch is not the good choice because it has no recycling value, and it all ends up in environment, on the landfill, or people burn it because it simply can't be recycled. So. But so it's also about consumer awareness, yeah, and labeling on on uh, packaging, because we we won't be a, we won't be doing without packaging, you know. And so uh, we we in this report we also looked at uh, consumer instructions and recycling symbols on packaging. It's just uh, like a, uh, when you. Uh, stick them all together on a paper which i did then it's like a comic 
all sorts of dancing puppets doing sorts of stuff with bins, but no instructions and uh, no consumer awareness raising about uh, why they should put it in bins and so on. And so producers should allocate more space on packaging on uh, on those type of public awareness uh, warnings. Yeah, that's uh, one part of the report. Okay. I don't know how much so, time we have. Uh, I think so we are almost yeah. running out of time. Perhaps uh, I could say something. <laughs> um, I'm actually the one less related to you, Richmond and Nina, because I'm not a campaigner. I haven't founded a startup and I'm an academic. But um, I would like to show you my personal attempt to reduce the use of single-use plastic items and as well uh, my, um, also my attempt and my strategy to reach an authority of a country in the Middle East regarding um, lifestyles around plastic. So I'm going to show you a small presentation. Hope that this works. I guess you can see a map. Is that all right? Yeah, you can see it. Yep. So, well, Oman is a country in the Arabian Peninsula, a border by the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia and Yemen, and uh, yet is ranked as one of the safest uh, countries in the Arab Peninsula and the safest place in the world for female tourists and with no terrorist incidents. Uh, a country especially known in earth sciences courses for its magnificent geology and textbook examples of geological structures. And a country well known by the warmth and hospitality of its people, the Omanis. This past March, me and two more friends, Caroline and Moha, went on holidays to Oman for six days. Landscapes, though, were not always as virgin and immaculate as I was showing you in the pictures before. While moving around its natural spaces, we also witnessed a very sad reality. Wherever we looked at, there was always a colored piece of material, mainly single-use plastic items like bags, water bottles, and food containers. And the account becomes more dramatic when I look back to our campsite night in Masira Island in the Arabian Sea. That night, we slept in a beach that turned out to be a spawning site for sea turtles. And as you can see on this picture already, there is plastic. We went for a walk with our lanterns and we could notice it was full of trash, well, dead fish, shells, crabs. The next morning, when we woke up just before dawn, the scenery of trash all around us, imagined during our night walk, became evident. We even made friends in Oman that later on shared with us some videos well, about, for example, here, camels eating trash. And at that moment, I decided to write a letter about our experiences with trash in Oman and the throwaway culture to three, re to three recipients. The UN Environment Section in West Asia, the Environment Society of Oman, and the Minister of Environment of Oman. I sent the letter via email with pictures attached, and I didn't receive any reply, as I was expecting. Two weeks later, uh, in Oxford, I attended a talk uh, where one of the speakers encouraged us, the audience, to write uh, handwritten letters as the best way to get our environmental messages across an authority instead of emails. A handwritten letter will stand out and will make the message more personal and urgent. I decided to do that. Two months later, at the beginning of August, when I already forgot about the letter, I received an email and a phone call from the Minister of Environment of Oman, Mohammad Al Tobi. I replied to his email, and well, um, whether something has been done with my answer, time will say. Might take some more weeks before I hear something, or I might not hear from him again. But uh, the important message here is that it's worth to take your time and write something that stems from your heart to reach an authority. 
Someone who has the power to reach lots of people, to spread their influence amongst lots of people at the same time and effect change. Because plastic free choices are many times set for us by governments. Um, now, I'm going to tell you a bit more about these plastic free choices that I have available in the city where I live, in Oxford. In essence, plastic free alternative products that I use in my daily life. Um, perhaps uh i'm running a bit a bit of uh i'm running out of we are running out of time but um well quickly i go to a uh, a market where i i usually get stuff in bulk like pulses cereals lentils and i just refill my containers i can get uh laundry liquid uh, washing up liquid shampoo conditioners so they also refill these things for you um for example my body lotion comes in a tin uh, it's from, from Lush, and every time I run out of it, they just put another one inside my tin. My toothpaste uh, comes in a glass jar. It's actually made in England, too. And uh, it's a great thing to avoid these non-recyclable toothpaste tubes. I use a bar of soap that comes wrapped in paper instead of a liquid soap that comes in a plastic bottle. My body scrub is a bar of mat, and my hand lotion comes in a tin, it's glycerin. I get my coffee and tea supplies in uh, paper, basically paper packaging. You can find alternatives to plastic in supermarkets, uh, cardboard for eggs, glass jars for oil, etc. Get your vegetables and fruit uh, loose. Use uh, uh, steel water bottle, canvas bags, uh, wooden cutlery when you travel, or try to make your, your own products like, for example, I make yogurt uh, with milk that comes in a, in a glass jar. Um, so, yeah, this is basically it. Um, I think it's time to wrap up. Um, I don't think we have time to make a general reflection. Um, well, I, actually, I would like to say something. Because uh, we've been talking about governments, right? And they are the ones that have most of the responsibility to make sure that things or changes happen. But as, as citizens, if we, if, if we think that things are not happening at the rhythm they should happen, then we shouldn't have a carefree attitude anymore to these things. No, we, we usually think that it's governments who should do this well for us. And um, well, in this democratic society where we live, where we can make choices, and we've seen we have these choices available. So the fact of uh, selecting these choices and encouraging people to select these plastic free choices is a good sta statement of the things that need to be done. And by doing this, I guess all this will resonate at a political level. So I think we, we have to wrap up now. Uh, haven't been reading the chat. Don't know whether there are questions. Uh, I don't know whether Nina, you can see any questions here. Uh, yeah, Olga just asked me to uh, mention that uh, there's no more time for questions. So all questions which have not been answered yet uh, will be posted in the on the forum in the on course. On the forum. All right. Yeah. And uh, uh, well, a lot for your inspiring talk, Anna. <laughs> Great thank example. You. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can so, we can keep discussing on the chat, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, I just so want I, to say. Yeah. Uh, pardon. Say. No. Yeah. I think we should wrap it up. Uh, so I leave it up to you to wrap up. Yeah. Because we have... want to announce uh, for next week. So there will be a talk called Ocean Decade. Uh, so just uh, stay tuned with us next week, and this is all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.